This is a story that people in Kentucky are probably familiar with, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about this. I don't normally cover these types of stories, but this was something that came across my news feed today as I was scrolling and I thought it might be of interest to some people and there may be some people out there who've never heard about this. This is the story of Steve Nunn. Stephen Roberts Nunn was born November the 4th, 1952. He is an American convicted murderer and a former politician who served as sec Deputy Secretary of Health and Family Services for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. From 1990 to 2006, he was a Republican member of the House of Representatives from Byron County in Southern Kentucky. In 2011, Nunn received a life sentence without parole after pleading guilty to the murder of his ex fiancee His father was the late Kentucky Governor Louis B. Nunn. Uh, it just goes on to talk a little bit about his political career. He was elected to the 23rd District in the House of Representatives in 1990, and he represented Byron and Metcalf counties. He ran unopposed in 98, 2000, 2002, and 2004. While in office, he was known as a relative liberal who championed the rights of women and children and the disadvantaged. In 1998, he co-sponsored a law making it a death penalty for a person named in a domestic violence protective order to kill the person that they were supposed to be protected against, or the person who was being protected. So in other words, if someone got a restraining order against their, their husband and that man ended up murdering them, then he would be convicted as uh, in the death penalty. In 2006, after 15 years as a state rep, he lost his bid for re-election. In 2007, he announced his support of Democratic gubernatorial nominee Steve Bashir a former lieutenant governor who handedly unseated the current, the, the governor at that time was Fletcher. Um, I'll move on from all that. That's just his political um, career. In March of 2009, Steve Nunn, 56, resigned his state position as Deputy Secretary for Health and Family Services after being placed on administrative leave in February as a result of an assault against a 29-year-old Lexington woman named Amanda Ross, who was his former fiance. She had gotten a protective order against him for domestic violence. On September 11, 2009, Ross was, Ross, Amanda Ross was shot to death outside of the Opera House Square complex in Lexington, Kentucky. That same day, Nunn was found by police with his wrists cut in Hart County near the grave of his parents. He was arrested and taken into custody, and he was taken to a hospital in Bowling Green where he was in fire condition. Um, he was charged with six counts of wanton endangerment of a police officer. When they tried to arrest him, he fired a 38 caliber handgun. So he was charged with um, a wanton, endanger, uh, wanton, wanton endangerment of a police officer. On September the 14th, Nunn was taken to Hart County Jail after being discharged from the hospital. The same day, he was charged by the Lexington Police with the murder of Amanda Ross. Nunn was transferred to Fayette County Detention Center. The next day, he entered a not guilty plea to the murder charges. On November the 10th, 2009, Nunn was indicted on charges of murder and violating a protective order. So the irony here is he wrote a law that it would be a death penalty case if someone murdered someone while they were on a protective order. And he turned around and did the very thing that he wrote the law for. 
um, it's somewhat familiar to what's going on in our current state of office, but um, so he basically went to prison for what he wrote a law about murdering someone while they have a protective order against you. Um, he ple he pleaded guilty to her murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving his sentence at the Little Sandy Correctional Complex in Sandy Hook, Kentucky. On November the 4th, 2014, Nunn was eligible to receive his full state pension of $28,210 annually based on his legislative service. State law permits pension benefits to former lawmakers unless they commit a crime while in office. So he was in office at the time that he committed this murder, so as far as I know, he would still be eligible to receive those benefits. In the meantime, though, the Ross family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against him. In August of 2013, a Fayette Circuit judge ordered Steve Nunn to pay the family $24 million for the wrongful death of Amanda Ross. The judge ruled Nunn to pay $20 million for punitive damages he commanded Nunn to pay $23,000 for medical expenses, $27,000 for funeral expenses, $3 million against her future earnings and pain and suffering. In the months after Amanda's death, her mother, Diane Ross, began advocating for the protection of other victims of domestic violence. She wanted to bring to light domestic violence under Amanda's law. The law was passed in 2010 in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It increases the use of GPS tracking units to enhance the protection of domestic violence victims. Judges can invoke the law on a case-by-case -case basis. According to Federal Electronic Monitoring Resource Center, there are currently 12 states with laws that allow judges to order GPS units to be worn by people who have a protective violence or a you know domestic violence protection order. Um, this it's it's like an ankle bracelet like people wear when they're on parole or probation, so that they can be tracked if they go outside of a certain jurisdiction. They can be tracked, and um, in this case, if they came within a certain um, distance from the person that they're protected that that they're that has the protection order against them then they would be arrested for that um, that may work but you know in some cases they would probably get to the person before the police could get to them so I honestly don't know how effective it really would be but I mean it's better than you know nothing and if the person that has the protection order gets an alert a phone call a warning or if the police come to them to say okay we uh, we're going to alert you that this person had this GPS tracker is within a certain mileage of you then that might work but I wanted to talk about that because there's this um, do as I say, not as I do in politics, in the government. This was something that was big during the pandemic when people were being told to wear a mask, not to um, gather in groups. And we saw our, our politicians who were making those rules for us doing the exact opposite of what they were telling the people that they should be doing. Revenge for real. How did a promising legislator become a killer? He was a governor's son, a crusader, a womanizer, a booze hound, a stalker, and finally a murderer.
This is from ABC News, and this is dated 2010. In 2009, Steve Nunn, a former state representative and the son of a former Kentucky governor, killed his ex-fiancee. Now, I think it's important to know what had gone on between the two of them. How long had they been in a relationship? Um, it says that Steve Nunn had a wandering eye and an appetite for women. Behind the gates of Nunn's family estate, things were getting ugly. In 1994, uh, his father, his mother, Beulah, filed for a divorce against her, against her husband, Louis Nunn, who was the father of Steve Nunn, and got a restraining order against him. Things got worse after an incident turned violent. Um, Steve came to the protection of his mother when he thought she was going to be physically abused by his father during a family argument and apparently he attacked his father. The elderly man fired back and accused his son of physically abusing him. The father and son stopped speaking to each other. And Steve Nunn divorced his wife in 1992 and married for the second time in 1996. He had no relationship with his father at that point. His new wife, Tracy Dameron, was a bubbly, beautiful daughter of Kentucky coal magnate. She was a former flight attendant. And she adapted easily to the life of being a politician's wife. She attended Kentucky Derby Day parties, fundraisers, and society balls. Dameron said the man she married loved to sing and dance and have fun and enjoy life. He was a humanitarian. With his new wife at his side, Nunn found his signature cause protecting the victims of domestic violence. In 1998, he co-sponsored legislation that made it a death penalty offense when a person in a domestic violence order murders the protected individual. In 2002, Dameron helped her husband arrange what should have been the final piece of the puzzle for his success. He was able to reconcile with his father. They were literally hugging each other, she said. I remember sitting back and thinking I had witnessed a miracle from God. By then, Nunn was ready to take on the biggest gamble of his political career, and he campaigned to run as a Republican nominee for the governor of Kentucky. But the father-son relationship didn't translate into a primary election victory. Nunn lost, get, getting only 13% of the vote. Um, the following year, he suffered a bigger loss. His father died, and it left him, according to some people in his circle, it left him with an identity crisis. His whole identity as a human being was the, being the son of the former governor. He began to enjoy the vices, and he was consuming alcohol and it was said that he was cruising for sex on websites, uh, hookup sites. According to Tracy Dameron, she says, I went to bed one night with my husband and woke up the next day living a nightmare. He lost his seat in the state legislature. It was after the apparent demise of his political Career, his marriage was next. Nunn and Tracy divorced in 2006. Tracy got away from me, he said. I didn't want to hurt her. All I do is hurt people. Just when it was said that he had hit rock bottom in 2007, he had a third chance at love. Amanda Ross was the daughter of a politically powerful father, Terrell Ross. Ross was in her late 20s with an intention of making her, her career in politics. That's part of what drew her to none. 
She went to the governor's ball with him, and the next day she was on the front page of the Courier Journal in a dress with Steve Nunn. The couple got engaged in 2008. It wasn't just Nunn's love life that was on the upswing. After he crossed party lines to endorse Democrats for Governor Steve Bashir, he was rewarded with an appointment as Deputy Secretary to the Department of Health and Family Services, overseeing the social welfare programs and dealing with spousal abuse. His career was making a comeback, and his, and his fiancée, Amanda Ross, had landed a job at the Kentucky State Department of Insurance. But life was far from perfect. When you take a couple and they get jealous, they're not themselves and the relationship becomes volatile. That volatility manifested itself in incidents like the one that happened in a restaurant. He called her a bitch and she got up and dumped a glass of water in his lap and walked out. Another time, she found out he was cheating on her. She had his phone and was going through it. She threw his phone in the river because he refused to give her his password. The relationship reached the point of no return on February the 17th, 2009, with what began as a small fight that escalated. She said something that she wanted to go out the next night and get some chicken wings. And he said, I'm not sure I do. They got into an argument. She told me, this is according to one of her friends, she told me that he got up to leave and she blocked the door. She said that Nine pushed and hit her and she hit him cutting his face with her ring. Ross filed an emergency protection order. Two weeks after the fight, a judge ruled that Nunn did hit Ross and granted a restraining order requiring that he have no contact with her for one year. Within 48 hours of the ruling, Nunn tendered his resignation as the depart from the Department of Family Services. Bentley said Nunn snapped, indulging once again in alcohol and sex with strangers. But it got worse. Nunn was also obsessed with revenge. He wanted to get even with Amanda Ross, who he blamed for destroying his career. To him, she ruined his life, and he and she had to pay. Police, who later investigated Nunn, said that he tried to get back at her by showing nude pictures that she had sent him to his friends. So basically, I guess that's kind of a revenge porn thing that she had. He had nude photos of her, and he was showing them around to people. And then, he, according to her friends, he began stalking her. She would be in her family room, and he would literally be outside her window, looking in at her from the patio. His obsession ultimately turned fatal. On November 11, 2009, as Ross was leaving her apartment to go to work, she was shot dead. There were no eyewitnesses, but thanks to her protection order, police had a suspect. Nunn was apprehended the same day and charged with her murder. In a, in a deal to avoid the death penalty, a punishment required by domestic violence law that Nunn himself had helped to write, he entered a plea deal in exchange for a sentence of life without parole. And so this, I, I wanted to share that story because a lot of these stories that I cover are about average, everyday people. We don't hear about them. This I remember when this took place in Kentucky, and I remember seeing stuff about it on the news. I remember his ex-wife being interviewed and talking about him and their relationship together. But we don't hear about that from the people that we that are found dead in the woods somewhere or someone who's found who goes missing. Oftentimes and and very often when when a woman especially goes missing, the police automatically start to zoom in on her male relationships 
Was it a husband? Was it a boyfriend? An ex? Was it someone in her neighborhood who maybe had a, a you know, obsession with her? And many times it turns out that it's a stranger, and many times the person is never found. There's so many cases like this out there where women are, and not just women, men too. And now we're hearing more and more about same-sex couples where, where this happens. Quite a bit in same-sex male relationships. Uh, violence against partners. And um, I wanted to talk about this story because it's so... It shows you the irony of how so many women and men out there, especially women, I'm, I'm going to say mostly women, get restraining orders against their spouse, their ex, a boyfriend. And how many times are those protection orders violated? How many times does a woman... And, and it's just a piece of paper, keep that in mind, without some type of monitoring. And that was what this woman, this, this Amanda Ross's mother, advocated for a bill. Steve Nunn did not get the death penalty, even though he wrote a law that said, if you murder someone while they have a restraining order against you, then you're going to go to, to the, you know, you're going to get the death penalty. Death penalty cases may still be heard in Kentucky. People may still be given the death penalty, but it's not enforced or it's not carried out. It's kind of just been pushed to the back burner, I guess, so to speak. But there are women out there right now, there are men and women out there in the world right now who are being, you know, have violence committed against them. They get restraining orders and they end up dead, they end up missing while the police probably start with that person and the family and the friends and the neighbors and the co-workers all say they were violently, they were violent with, with this person. This person was terribly afraid of them, scared for their life. Many times people will say if something happens to me you know who to look at, you know, you know who did it. But in a case like this, where it's political, and the people are well-connected and well-known, and um, it's all over the news, can, so you can just imagine what the average everyday woman goes through, or person goes through, going to court and trying to get a judge to say, yeah, I believe that there's enough fear here and enough evidence here that this person could attempt to murder the person that they have that has a restraining order against them. So I'm going to put an ankle bracelet on you, monitor you. I don't know if that's enforced or not. I, I don't know. I don't know what the statistics are of, of women who are murdered or people who are murdered by their partner um, who have had domestic violence orders against them prior to them either going missing or being murdered by that person. I don't know. But I thought it was a story worth talking about and I thought that it, there may be people out there who not, had not heard about that. Now, set aside all the politics and set aside the fact that Steve Nunn wrote this law or helped to, you know, write this law that this Amanda Ross's mother helped come up with the law um, advocating for for the GPS monitoring which may have saved her daughter's life if it had been enforced you know if, if that had been a law in place I don't know I doubt it but it's possible I don't want to say that it's not that it you know wouldn't have helped it's possible, but I think we're dealing with the minds of someone who has, in violent, has violent intentions to begin with. So, 
I just wanted to share that story and uh, talk about how, you know, like I said, set aside the politics of it. And let's just say this was your normal average couple out there that it wouldn't have gotten the coverage that this got. Thanks for watching.